with this new adoption of a new security strategy, Japan is now committed to the defense of Taiwan. Is Japan remilitarizing? A recent Time magazine article titled Prime Minister Fumio Kishida wants to abandon decades of pacifism and make his country a true military power. But is that true? What does Japan's new national security strategy actually mean and how do its neighbors perceive that? Stick around as we will try to answer these questions. Hello, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today I would like to look with you at Japan's new national security strategy which already came out in December 2022 but since we have seen several developments over the last couple of months including the G7 summit and negotiations with China I would like to take the this opportunity and look with you at uh, what this uh, new national security strategy at actually means and a bit how to interpret what's happening because it seems that especially in the US and in the West Japan is being framed as well clearly online it decided to increase its uh, its um, budget defense budget to 2% same as uh, NATO countries and which will mean naturally that it will uh, uh, do a lot of spending and uh, will uh, create new capabilities and very importantly it decided in the in December to add counter-strike capabilities to its um, security strategy and this is often interpreted as something um, quite aggressive. I wrote about all of this in an article um, over on neutralitystudies.com you can go and look that up if you want and um, read what I'm going to tell you about here in more detail over there. Um, but to start with, the most important thing to know is that Japan still today has this uh, famous Article 9 on its constitution, which is the renunciation of war. Um, it reads that aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat of use of force as means of settling international dispute. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea and air forces as well as other po war potential will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. This article was actually um, written for Japan by the US occupation forces uh, back in uh, 19. Uh, 45, 46, 47, uh, when Japan was not sovereign, when it was a defeated country after the Second World War, the occupation forces of MacArthur actually uh, created this uh, article and the whole, uh, most of the constitution. So, although this article is there, you also need to know that Japan still does have military forces. Um, actually, on this uh, global fire uh, military strength ranking, global firepower ranking, um, Japan ranks on place number eight. Uh, so for a nation that does not maintain any land, sea or uh, air forces, that's uh, that's quite high. I mean, Japan ranks above France and Italy and even Turkey. So how does that work? Well, Japan maintains so-called self-defense forces, which was kind of a way to square a circle for Japan to kind of rebuild the military without... Um, making it too large or too threatening and um, one must say in the defense of the of the constitution Japan has refrained from using its military for for offensive purposes uh, for the past 70 years I mean it didn't even um, contribute to uh, peacekeeping operations until about 2003 and then slowly slowly kind of tried to integrate its uh, Japanese self-defense forces into foreign missions so Japan has a military but it hasn't really used it so far and this, uh, the second part of this Article 9, the second paragraph, is what uh, hawks in Japan um, in its political process always wanted to change. Um, get rid of the second part. The first part has never been in dispute. Even the Abe government never said, never wanted to, ch to change the, the first paragraph. But they always wanted to change the second paragraph to allow Japan to have regular military forces. Now, uh, there was this recent very interesting seminar at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, which is a university, but also a think tank. And it's it has a lot of um, national security folks, folks there from uh, 
Japan and abroad. Um, it's not exactly like if uh, it's not exactly a neocon think tank as in the US. Um, it features really a variety of different thinkers, and they did a 90 minutes event on basically how Japan's new uh, security strategy is to be uh, interpreted. And they had two very interesting speakers. First, um, uh, Narushige Michishita, uh, vice president of this institute, and also uh, Yoko Iwama, who's a professor of uh, security studies there. Um, and I would like to show you a couple of clips of these two people and then also of two of the students who study at GRIPS, which, by the way, is also my old uh, university where I did my uh, MA and PhD. So these uh, people are all are all connected to Japanese security in, so, in some way, and they have like different ways of looking at the, uh, the strategy. So let's start with uh, Yoko Iwama and what she has to say about what's new about the security strategy. The most important part is you heard a lot about counter-strike capability, uh, which we had refrained from uh, until uh, this moment, really, uh, because we had interpreted it as going beyond the exclusively defense-oriented policy. Um, so have we given up the defense? Mm, I don't really think so. I still think Japan is a country committed to defense and exclusively to defense and only to use defense in um, military forces in case of uh, defense. Um, but uh, the means to uh, the means with which we are planning to achieve that uh, objective is changing. Um, one, because the adversary is changing, potential threat is changing, technology is changing, a lot of things is changing, and so we need to adapt ourselves. So um, you might wonder, though, uh, is it possible to actually uh, talk about including counter-strike capabilities in your, in your defense strategy and still call that uh, defensive? Uh, th this was what's being discussed. This is what the Times uh, magazine article kind of uh, uh, underlined, right? I mean, counter-strike means that you can now attack uh, an another nation, foreign soil. But I would like to point out here that this national security um, document that was published in December actually tries again and again to assure that Japan still views its uh, strategy as one that is focused on defense, right? Over and over. Look at this here on page number five. As a peace-loving nation, Japan will adhere to the basic policy of maintaining an exclusive national defense-oriented policy, not becoming a military power that poses a threat to other countries, and observing the three nu non-nuclear principles. The three non-nuclear principles, what are what are they? Uh, if you go to the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, the, it's clearly stated here that they mean not possessing, not producing, and not permitting the introduction of nuclear weapons, so no transiting on Japanese soil. That's uh, that's what the, what they are promising and what they've what Japan has been keeping um, for the longest time. And that's why you know Japan is actually under the nuclear umbrella of the United States. The U.S. promises to uh, in its alliance with Japan not only to defend it with uh, with its uh, conventional weaponry, but it's on, uh, but that if an attack, a nuclear attack happened on Japan, the US would treat it as if the, a nuclear attack on its own soil had happened and it would shoot back with its own uh, nuclear missiles. So Japan is covered um, by a nuclear umbrella, but it doesn't have its own. And Japan keeps saying that we will not develop our own, although it's also kind of an open secret, especially in these security circles, that the breakout time for Japan is about six months. The civil... Uh, program they have could lead to a Japanese bomb within about six months and it could, it could be mounted on the Japanese uh, missiles that they have. Uh, they are good enough in this miniatur miniaturization. So, um, but for the moment, for the moment, nobody, no politician would ever speak about this um, in, 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 a, in a public forum and this is not entertained as a thought um, by politicians. This is kind of the worst case scenario thinking that's happening in Tokyo, but not anything that anyone could um, publicly say because the non-nuclear uh, the, the nuclear taboo is very, very strong in this country. So uh, that's one thing. And then the other thing that the, the document mentions is that the Japan-US alliance, including the provisions for extended deterrence, what I just talked about, will remain the cornerstone of Japan's national security policy. So the new strategy is 
keep the old strategy as it is um, and just add a new capability now what is that capability um, it's this counter strike uh, uh, this 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 counter strike uh, um, portion so defined as capabilities which in the case of missile attacks by an opponent enable Japan to mount effective counter strikes against the opponent to prevent further attacks. Now this is something that has been left out quite a bit in uh, international media that when Japan talks about counter strikes it thinks exclusively about it in terms of missile attacks and you, you must understand that Japan's greatest strategic fear is to be attacked primarily by uh, North Korea, um, North Korean missiles, at a lower degree also Chinese missiles are of course a threat, but this is the single biggest uh, f uh, fear that the entire country has. So until now, the strategy was that once these missiles are launched, Japan's uh, missile defense system that they've been building up since 2003 would just shoot these uh, incoming missiles down. Now, unfortunately, no such uh, system is absolutely 100% uh, uh, safe and there is a good chance that some of these missiles might come through uh, especially since North Korea um, has been building up more missile uh, capacity right they have more more of them now and if they shoot a lot of them at the same time the chances of one of them going through is quite high in order to counter that the document says these counter-strike uh, capabilities are the capabilities on which the government expressed its view in uh, 1956 that they they would only be used as long as it is deemed that there are no other means to defend against attack by guided missiles and others. And if we look at the, this 1956, this 1956 interpretation of the of the constitution, um, you again find on the foreign uh, um, on the Ministry for Foreign Affairs the three new conditions for use of force: one, when an armed attack against Japan occurs or when an armed attack against a foreign country that is in close relationship with Japan, aka the United States, occurs and as a result threatens Japan's survival and poses a clear danger to fundamentally overturn people's rights to live. The word occurs here is really, really important. Um, Japan does not contemplate using these uh, weapons in an offensive manner of striking first. An attack would have had to already have occurred a missile would have to actually fly to japan and uh, or already have hit japan in order for the counter strike capabilities to uh, to be um authorized second when there is no other appropriate means available to repel an attack and ensure japan's survival uh, and uh, protect its people so there's no other way so just shooting them down would probably not work you have to attack the bases uh, in North Korea or China from where they are coming. And thirdly, the use of force is limited to the minimum extent necessary. So to, the, the Japanese promised that they would not uh, just do indiscriminate destruction. It's not the way that you would use a, stri a, a, a strategic uh, nuclear missile, which basically lays waste to the entire country that attacks you, right? The MAD doctrine. No, it's the, it's the promise that it would only shoot at the, the place from where the missile these missiles um, actually are coming from in order to take out the, um, the the system that shoots them off. So this is really, really important to understand that Japan constrains itself, its capabilities that it wants to build up in this uh, core set. That's why the Japanese don't interpret this as new, right? They said already they would shoot down incoming missiles. Now they're saying we would, uh, if, if, no other option is available we would also shoot down the, the launchers from where they are coming even if they are like um, inside the country where they are coming from that's why this is still being framed as um, basically defensive but let's go let's go back and um, listen to what Yoko Iwama has to say about uh, what's new in this uh, new defense um, strategy what I felt was really new was the admission uh, that you actually have to defend yourself on your own if necessary. I found that quite refreshing <laughs> um, because we had this tradition of hiding behind somebody, uh, Big Brother, for a very long time. And if you read the new security strategy document, you find several indications very clearly setting that in the end you have to do it yourself. And I think this resolve uh, is very new. 
it's still a resolve. It's not a capability yet. <laughs> um, will we ever achieve that capability? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, maybe not. I mean, I don't really think any country in this world is capable of defending itself totally on its own. Um, but um, at least uh, we've, we're kind of facing up to that possibility and I find that uh, quite new. And I find that quite interesting because if she interprets this as meaning that Japan could now or in the future, once it has the capabilities, also defend itself, what that means is it could potentially reduce its reliance on the United States and build what the French are calling strategic autonomy. Now, at this point, it's anyone's guess if it will go that way or not, but um, not everybody interprets the national security strategy in that way. I would like to show you now um, the clip of um, Narushiga Michishita, who is more of a hawk in the security sphere, and how he interprets what's actually new about the, the uh, new strategy. Simply put, well, Japan is trying to do many different things, but simply put, Japan, with this new adoption of a new security strategy, Japan is now committed to the defense of Taiwan. What does it mean? If there is a war across the Taiwan Strait, the likelihood is Japan will commit its armed forces, called self-defense forces, to assist the defense of Taiwan together with the United States. And that would be a, a tough choice for Japan to make, right? And uh, the best case, in the best case scenario, there should be no war across the Taiwan Strait in the first place. But in order to uh, provide credible deterrence to prevent such war from breaking out, we need to be strong enough and that's exactly what Japan is trying to do. Also about this one, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, because if we go to the new national security strategy and actually read what it, uh, what it says about Taiwan, um, you know, Taiwan is really only mentioned on two pages, more or less. Here's the first one, uh, the first paragraph, like, it reads as follows. While maintaining its policy of peaceful reunification of Taiwan, China has not denied the possibility of using military force. True. In addition, China has been intensifying its military activities in the sea and airspace surrounding Taiwan, including the launch of ballistic missiles into the waters around Japan. Um, regarding peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, concerns are mounting rapidly, not only in the Indo-Pacific region, including Japan, but also in the entire international community. Yeah, all that is true. These are like stating a couple of facts. Lovely. Um, now let's go and see where else uh, there is Taiwan. Uh, we have it here on page 14 again. Japan's relationship with Taiwan has been maintained uh, as a non-governmental working relationship based on the China-Japan joint communique of 1972. True, Japan, there's no country-to-country -country relationships because Japan actually doesn't recognize uh, Taiwan as the representative of China. Uh, it recognizes mainland China, right? Um, like almost every other country in the world. Um, so it only has non-governmental uh, non relationship uh, with it. Uh, Taiwan is an extremely important partner and a precious friend of Japan, with whom Japan shares fundamental values, including democracy, and has close economic and personal ties. Yeah, true. I mean, a lot of, uh, lot of exchange going on. Peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait is an indispensable element for the security and prosperity of the international community, and Japan will continue to make various efforts based on its position that the cross-strait issues are expected to be resolved peacefully. Well, you see how it's really hard to interpret from this basic, most important fundamental text of Japan's new security strategy that Japan would automatically come to the defense of Taiwan. So um, this is being kept quite vague. Um, and I do see how the hawks in Tokyo and also in Washington would love to interpret uh, Japan's resolve as one that's interventionist and would, uh, would allow Japan to together with the United States to, de to defend Taiwan militarily. But for, purely from the security strategy, this is not a given. 
um, and the, it is uh, admitted over here, also like later on, uh, Narushi Gamichishta also admits that in a case of actual war between um, China and Taiwan, China would of course try to convince Japan not to intervene and say and, and threaten it, uh, saying that uh, if you try to, in, uh, to intervene in, in favor of Taiwan, we would have to attack you, right? Um, so this game would clearly go on. And in Japan itself, you know, the resolve to interfere in, in Chinese-Taiwanese relations is not very high. Let me show you this. There's this interesting uh, opinion poll that was done uh, just recently, May 1st, 2023, by Asahi, um, which uh, asked 3,000 randomly selected voters uh, what they think about interventions in uh, uh, in, a, in a possible conflict between China, Taiwan and, and the United States. And 56% said that the self-defense forces role should be limited to rear guard support of the U of the US military. So no direct intervention, just help to supply the US military if it if the US military goes in for a for a fight. And 27% even said that the SDF should not work with the US military. And 11% said the SDF should use force. So only 11% are in favor of Japan actually using military capabilities to to battle with China in case something happened in Taiwan. The rest says no opinion or clearly no, or like maybe a little bit of support to the United States. So what we can infer from this is that, you know, dying for Taipei or for also in Korea for Seoul is about the same, um, is really not a popular slogan here in this country. So the population is very war weary. They are not like all in for a war with, uh, with uh, China uh, or with North Korea. So the the public sentiment is quite against this, which is, in my view, uh, a good thing, which is probably which is hopefully going to to stabilize the situation. Um, now, with this said, the new security strategy does have some impact also abroad, like the Koreans already said they're not happy with uh, Japan, including, for example, Takeshima, what which the Koreans called a uh, doctor in in this um, in this uh, document saying that okay we have overlapping claims and this island is clearly our, um, ours Korean island not yours uh, Japan so they've been unhappy with that they've also been unhappy because they do remember that Japan was an aggressor in the second world war and that they were occupied um, uh, I mean uh, colonized for uh, 40 years by Japan and um, they hold a, a, a very strong grudge about this also about like several issues but there are other concerns as well that the Koreans have and in this talk there was also a um, a Korean expert uh, the uh, Chu Hyung Kim who explained those concerns to the audience I'd like to show you this one I would like to share the um... Um, the discussions that I've had with the um, uh, dozens of South Korean defense experts on this topic. We had a new consensus that uh, Japan's new security policy would benefit South Korean defense only with the three conditions if they are met. Condition number one would be the buildup of Japan's uh, security buildup should be productive or implemented in the context of the strong U.S.-Japan alliance structure and fortunately it is uh, stipulated in the document, so I think that condition is met. Condition number two, greater intelligence sharing between South Korea and Japan, and that goes way broader than sharing mere North Korean ground target information. Last but not least, condition number three, um, at any rate, Japan should assure providing logistical support to U.S. forces in case of Korean contingency. Also interesting, right? I mean, the Koreans would only trust Japan to to be a reliable partner if it's integrated in the in the larger defense um, structure, and um, they are, they do worry about Japan basically um, not sharing enough intelligence for a very good reason. Um, listen to the second part of his uh, speech. The situation will become more even more complex once Japan introduces hypersonic weapons somewhere around 2030 because of its speed. It might take out mobile launchers, and it would actually needlessly escalate the situation in, in the Korean Peninsula. And our team in the Korean expert community have come up with a situation. What if North Korea launches a missile against U.S. bases located in South Korea, not nuclear-tipped, but armed with conventional warhead? And in that case, if South Korean and U.S. combined forces interpret that, 
that this attack is not a prelude for a follow-up massive, uh, massive attack, we would take a measured response. However, at the same time, if Japan interpret the situation that this is an existential threat for Japanese national interest and activates collective self-defense and launch one of those hypersonic weapons and take out North Korean launchers, North Korea would probably retaliate against South Korea because it's doable for them and needlessly escalating the situation. Therefore, um, South Korea and Japan should uh, share intelligence sharing and we should be on the same page, especially when we deal with hypersonic weapons. Also interesting, right? So there are tactical issues where Japan could become something like a loose cannon uh, and upset the, 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 the strategic relationship between North and South Korea, especially if there was an exchange of fire, right? And it might then create a, a worse situation than what it would have to be. Now, the other one who was on this panel um, is a Taiwanese uh, student at this uh, graduate institute who's writing his PhD there at the moment, and he is also the son of the current Taiwanese uh, foreign minister. So Di Wu does, of course, not speak for his father. He does not speak for the nation of Taiwan. Uh, he does not speak for, uh, for anyone else but himself. But his interpretation of what the security um, strategy means for Taiwan is interesting. They he sees it more positively, uh, in a more positive light than, than the, his Korean uh, counterpart. Um, but he also points out how important it is that uh, Japan uh, works with China. Have a listen. Japan's increase in power is important to the region for another region, for another reason, which is that Asia needs an Asian power with, its, with which its interests are persistently anchored in this region. Although we are fortunate to have um, United States as our security guarantor, but United States is a global power with diverse respons responsibilities. Many Asian countries, including Taiwan, remember when America strategically diverted its resources to elsewhere during the next gen shock and the war on terror. The Russian aggression against Ukraine is also diluting the resources of the United States. And until the end of uh, February 2023, the United States has sent 46.6 billion of new military assistance to Ukraine. This global commitment is depleting U.S. stocks of weapons and overburdening its defense industrial base. And as a result, many weapons scheduled to deliver to Taiwan, such as javelins and stingers, have been postponed. And with like-minded Asian countries, while like-minded Asian countries could resend America's pivotal resources to elsewhere during the 1970s and 2000s, the current geopolitical reality does not permit so. Therefore, it is very important for, a, for Japan, the third largest economy of the world, to step up and become a greater Asian power. And then another reason why Japan's um, security forum from last year was important is because it is capability focused. And with better capabilities, Japan can, be, become, more auto can become more autonomous in its foreign policy decision making. And I would argue that it doesn't actually bring a more stable regional environment. And my reason is that Asian countries, due to their geo, pro, geo, geographical proximity to China, are bound to have different China policy approaches from the United States. While a mere 8.6% of American export goes to China, regional countries have a much higher figure. 22% for Japan, 25% for Korea, 40% for Taiwan, and 20% 20 20 for Asian countries. This is one crucial reason why many states in this region do not or cannot follow a fully competition-oriented economic policy towards China. This can be seen from our positions on the Belt and Road Initiative, the coupling policy of the United States, and also the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And so if Japan can become more powerful and then more autonomous, a different trajectory for relationship with China is possible, especially on the economic front, assuring China that the, urge, that the current strategic competition is not a full-blown containment policy is an important deterrent going forward. And last but not least, I want to mention that Japan actually has its own very unique advantage in shaping the regional order, which is the trust by regional countries. The trust by Japan, the trust for Japan is high in both Taiwan and ASEAN countries. According to the survey by Japan Taiwan Exchange Association, which is a de facto embassy to, in Taiwan, the number of Taiwanese who believe that the island should develop a closer relationship with Japan has always been higher than those who favor better relationship with the United States. And also, even during the China-friendly Mind Joe administration, those who favor a close relationship with Japan and China were roughly equal. 
And at the same time, according to the State of Southeast Asian Survey from 2019 to 2023, Japan has been the most trusted major power by ASEAN countries. And most notably, compared to the United States, the trust toward Japan by ASEAN has been rather stable. And the consistent trust toward Japan from Taiwan and ASEAN is perhaps a result of what I mentioned earlier. Japan is an Asian power with its interests persistently and stably anchored in this region. And regional countries can expect Japan to represent its best interests. And another reason I would argue is how China frames the current regional dynamics, which is that the current strategic competition is a result of America's attempt to maintain its hegemony, whether it is through um, official propaganda or covert disinformation warfare, it has been China's central focus to undermine the United States' legitimacy in this region. Taiwan is facing the same challenge. Pro-China politicians and media on the island parrot Chinese propaganda, accusing the United States for joining Taiwan into greater power conflict and putting the lives of the Taiwanese people in danger. And they're referred to places including Washington's switch of diplomatic relationship to Beijing in 1979. Uh, as, a, as a case to frame the United States as an unreliable, self-interested power. But to the contrast, Japan is, is really spared from such similar criticisms. So with the trust by many countries in the, re in the region, Japan is in a good position to shape the regional order without feeding into China's US-focused propaganda. So it's, it's interesting, right, that a Taiwanese uh, security thinker would actually point out how important it is that Japan has more autonomy, meaning, of course, autonomy also from the United States, in order to play this balancing role with China and affirm that China is not being contained, but that uh, the regional order is simply being uh, um, upheld. So... At this point, whether the new security strategy will actually lead to an escalation or de-escalation is, is, is not clear. And also the way that China has been reacting was like it was very quiet. There were there were critical tones and critical comments coming from the from the Chinese embassy in Japan and, uh, and so on. But overall, it was very quiet on the Chinese front. And um, the Chinese just in November, um, shortly before this uh, strategy came out, actually had a top level dialogue between Xi and Kishi and they praised the, their relationship and then in February so two months after the, uh, the strategy came out they again um, held a security, a security dialogue between the two which if you go to the Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic right you read there that in, that the two are actually quite in agreement the two sides agreed that um, as close neighbors in important countries in the region and the world China and Japan should strengthen dialogue and communication properly manage and handle disputes and differences, work together to enhance mutual trust and advance cooperation, implement the important consensus reached by the leaders of the two countries on building constructive and stable China-Japan relations. So that's the, uh, the, the agreement they reached back in November um, and relationship fit for the new era and make greater contributions to peace, stability, de um, development and prosperity of the region and the world at large. And that's the Chinese saying that. And this meeting took place during Balloon Gate in the US, right? You remember that crazy moment, right? When everybody was like about to, to go nuts because there were, there were some balloons in the air. Um, so while that happened in the US, Japan still has its um, security dialogue with China. And apparently that seems at least to some extent be to, to work toward like de-escalation. And the, the, the two just announced uh, a few days ago that they now have a hotline between the two countries, right? I mean, the, the, the Minister of Defense of Japan can now directly call the Minister of Defense of China um, with a phone, with a hardwired phone, like saying like, guys, we need to talk, right? This is quite important in terms of stabilizing um, a potential dangerous situation. So what is Japan's new security strategy? Counter-strike um, abilities, yes, but counter-strike doesn't mean counter-attack. It's still a pre, uh, it's still not even a preemptive capability. It's solemnly meant as if already an attack is underway, if the, these rockets are flying or have already hit Japan, Japan would be able to uh, destroy the launchers. Um, Japan will create more defense um, ability. At the moment, it's not framed as anything that could be used for offensive purposes. Um, Japanese military experts, uh, security experts are not in agreement about what it actually means, which leaves us to to guess that probably also on the highest level, this is this is an unresolved. Uh, the, the Japan's security future is not is not is not set in stone. It could go either towards more integration with the U.S. It could go toward more um, 
uh, indep uh, independent strategic um, autonomy. Um, probably it does both at the same time. If you want to watch the entire um, one hour uh, talk uh, by Grips, it's going to be below in the in the description. It's quite interesting um, to follow. Not all of their talks is as, hard, as high quality as this one, but this one is. I recommend watching it. If you have questions, please uh, drop them down there in the comments and I see you next time.